Are you in Romans 5? All right, let's read. Therefore, being justified by what? By faith. I thought you were justified by all your good doings because that's how we live. No, we are being justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Hallelujah, Lord, teach us patience, but just hurry up, please. (laughs) And patience, experience, and experience hope. And hope makes not a shame because what? The love of God is shed in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. Let's read that in the Amplified. Such hope never disappoints or deludes or shames us, for God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which he has given us. Newsflash, you cannot experience, receive, or understand the love of God without the Holy Spirit. The world recognizes God, gives him glory, but they cannot take part of his love because they do not accept his son. And if you don't accept the son, you cannot have the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit for what? He is our helper, he is our comforter, he is our guide. What did Jesus say? He says, it is good for you that I leave. Because I'm gonna give you the 512 commandments to keep them so that you can one day be saved. No, no, he said, I'm gonna give you the Holy Spirit. He's gonna tell you the things that I tell him. He's gonna show you the things I show him. And he's going to remind you of the things that I've already told you. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely a righteous man will die one pre-adventure for a good man will some even dare to die. But God commands his love towards us in this, that while we were yet sinners, ah, Jesus, I don't think we understand the full impact of this verse. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Can I get a glory? Man, sure. I think you need to take that chapter and just read it slowly, verse by verse, and just start trying to grasp what has happened when Christ died for us. When we were yet in our sins, when you were at your worst, God gave his everything so that you can be reconciled back to God. Oh. One thing that I want to touch on this morning is there is no love in judgment. We're going to go a bit deeper into that topic. So whenever you find yourself judging someone else, there is absolutely no place that you can have love. And you cannot say you judge because you love. Because there cannot be love in judgment. Oof. Let's go to Romans 13. I'm just reading Bible here, so. Hallelujah. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that are ordained of God, whosoever therefore resist the power, resist the ordinance of God, and they must resist, shall receive to themselves damned nation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Will you then be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and you shall have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. 
But if I do that which is evil, be afraid, for he bears not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that does evil. We are saved from the wrath by being justified through the blood of Jesus. Wherefore, you must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For this cause pay you tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all your dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor, owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loves has fulfilled the law. So to owe someone means you have debt. Owe no man anything but to love one another. Let's jump to the to the amplified. It says, keep out of debt <laughs> and owe no man anything except to love one another. Oh man, look at your neighbor, say, darling, I love you. For he who loves his neighbor, who practices loving others, has fulfilled the law relating to one another's fellow men, meeting all his requirements. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, have an evil desire, and any other commandment are summed up in the single command. You shall love your neighbor as you do yourself. Love does no wrong to one's neighbor. It never hurts anybody. Therefore, love meets all requirements and is fulfilling the law. Besides this, you know what is a critical hour this is, how it is high time now for you to wake up out of your sleep, roused to reality, for salvation is nearer to us now than we have first believed. The night is far gone. And the day is almost here. Let us drop the works and the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live and conduct ourselves honorably and becomingly as in the open light of day, not in revealing and drunkenness and immorality and debauchery, uh, not in quarreling and jealousy. Verse 14. But clothe yourself, clothe yourself. It says, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what that means? I have a a beautiful polo shirt on, it's nice, but if I start clothing myself with this denim shirt, you don't see my polo shirt anymore. The same with you. If you start clothing yourself with the Lord Jesus, all these things that you are struggling with is being hidden within him. See, we try to, to, to change our shirt. We to try and change who we are. How many of you have succeeded in changing who you are? Uh, New Year's resolutions for 20 years in a row and still not getting it right. You will not be able to change yourself. That's why Jesus came. (laughs) Ah, He has given you the cloak of righteousness. We have been made righteous through his blood. We have been saved from the wrath. 1 John 4, 18, it says, perfect love casts out All fear. Hallelujah. Let's go to Matthew 7. Thank you, Jesus. Remember last week I said, uh, I'm giving you a revelation that you can stop trying to be perfect because you're never going to be perfect. You as a single member cannot attain perfection because God didn't call you to stand alone. He called you to be part of the body. Matthew 7 it says, judge not that you be not judged. For what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. 
and with what measure you meet, it shall be measured unto you again. There is no love in judgment. There can be no love in judgment. It is impossible to judge someone and say you love them. So brethren, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech. Are you 1 Corinthians 2? Declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing amongst you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit, we speak wisdom amongst them that are perfect, not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of the world knew, for had they have known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Hallelujah. Why? Because the crucifixion of Jesus, that's why he says, I want to know nothing amongst you except Christ and him crucified. Why? Because if the princes of this world knew what happened there, they would have never crucified him. Because he took the judgment of this world upon himself. So that we are now made righteous. You know how you are made righteous? You have to go through judgment. You cannot be made righteous without passing through judgment. <sighs> My goodness. You have to be tested in order to have the stamp of approved. But we have been stamped. It says righteous. It says you are righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why if the princes knew what was gonna happen there, they would not have crucified Jesus. So you have to understand, in God there is no time. I just wanna give you a, a solution to is Christ on the cross, is he not on the cross? Forever Christ is crucified, forever. The price is paid once and for all, forever. Because in God there is no time. For, so since the beginning of this world, before the foundation of this world, he was crucified. So, right now, he is still crucified. But he is also risen. And he's sitting on the right hand of God because there's no time in God. That means the price that he paid is still paid. It is valid today. If I recognize and understand it and I know the power that is there, I can step into it. But as it is written, Verse nine, 1 Corinthians 2 verse nine. I has not seen, nor ear has heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. Come on, for the spirit searches the deep things, yea, the things of God. For what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of the man which is in him, even so the things of God knows no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things, come on, that we might know the things which are freely given to us. My goodness. Verse 12. So now we have received not the spirit of this world, but the spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us. who? Us. Who? Us. Can I get another who? <laughs> to you. Yes, darlings, to you. Freely. No connection or no strings attached. God doesn't give you blessings and say, all right, now you have to do this and this and this and this. When God gives to you, he gives. And when you mess up after that and you say, God, I'm sorry, he says, it's all right, just take more. 
but we get stuck because we are motivational people. We are conditional people. Yo, I think it's, it's beautiful that I said the capacity that we have is how God blesses us. Because the way we think God is the way that he acts upon us. Now let's talk about the thing about conditional love. Now we find ourselves sometimes and say, the people I trusted the most is the people that hurt me the most. It's true. Because it's my condition, if I give you this love, I expect this love back from you. So if I say, this person I trusted so much hurt me so bad, it means I had a condition for my love towards him in the first place. I've been in there and I've repented. I've learned my lessons, but once you realize it, it's like, all right, God, thank you. This life is just lessons upon lessons. Until you start getting the truth and start passing them, then God says, nice. Now you start understanding how much I love you. I think this life is just about God trying to reveal his love towards us. If he says, freely given to you, why do we then get to the place where we feel that we are working for his love again? So I want to bring this into a bit of retrospection for yourself. The love that you have one for another. Brothers, love one another. What love is of God? Oh, no man, anything except love. So is our love conditional or unconditional? Is the love that God has for you conditional or is it unconditional? So the love that we have for one another should be the same love that we are loved with. We can only give what we receive and yes, we have received, but do we understand? We've experienced the love of God, my goodness. But do we understand what we have experienced? Because the proof will be in the pudding, is how do you then give that to someone else? So the love of Christ was shed abroad in our hearts. Romans 13 at the end, he says, now clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. That means that which I received, I can now become and give. Because you and yourself will never be able to love unconditionally. It's impossible. You can only love that way through Jesus Christ. And that is just freely given to us. Wow. Which things we also speak, not in the words of man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judge all things, yet himself is judged of no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. You cannot use verse 15 to say you are now spiritual so you can judge all things and you are outside of judgment yourself. Because the next verse says we have the mind of Christ. Now let us go into what is the mind of Christ. Go back to Matthew 7. Judge not and you be not judged. For whatever judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured unto you again. And why do you behold the moth that is in your mother's, your mother's eye? Sorry, Ma. I apologize. Your brother's eye, but considereth not the beam that is in your own eye. Or how will you say to your brother, let me pull out the moth out of your own eye, uh, out of your eye, and behold, there is a beam in your own eye. You hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of your own eye and then you shall see clearly to cast out the mud out of your brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample under your feet and turn again and rend you. 
Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened up unto you. For everyone that asks receives. And he that seeks find. And to him that knock it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, he will give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, he will give him a serpent? If you, then being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall who? Your father. Your father. <laughs> which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him. Therefore, all right, so this is beautiful. Okay, now we have this revelation. Ah, God is going to give me whatever I ask him. Therefore, if you have the understanding that your father wants to bless you, therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, even do the same to them. These two are not separate. If you were here last week, reactions and results, combinations of things, you cannot separate them. They have a functionality. If you understand God, then you understand that the same way that I'm asking God for things in my life is the way that I'm gonna be to Yaku. Maybe God is expecting, or Yaku is expecting God to do this, and I'm right there to be that. All right, just going back to clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are still busy with the mind of Christ, right? Let's go back to Matthew 5. You are the salt of the earth, verse 13. You are the light of the world, verse 14. <laughs> verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Oh, where are we going to go? Verse 27, you have heard that it was said of them of all time that you should not commit adultery, but I say unto you, that whatsoever looks on a woman to lust after has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if your eye, right eye offend you, pluck it out. My goodness. It has been said, whatsoever shall put away his wife and give her a writing of divorce. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, commits adultery. Ooh. Let your communication be yes or no. For whatsoever is more than these comes evil. And you have heard it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, resist that you resist not evil, but whosoever you shall smite thee on your right cheek, turn unto him the other also. If any man will sue you, thee at the law, and take away your coat, give him your cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him too. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them who despitefully use you and persecute you. We find this, Paul writes it in, in Romans 12 as well. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and curse not. That you may be children of your Father, which is in heaven. For he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward do you have? Not even the publicans the same. And if you salute your brethren only, what do more do you have than others? Do not even the publicans do so as well. All right, so then verse 48. Be you therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. So we have the mind of Christ. What is this mind? 
After this man, I pray you, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. Owe no man anything except love. <laughs> but face it, we fall in debt every now and then. We do. And if you do, I want to tell you it's all right. Because the price has already been paid for your debt. Oh, I miss my father very much. One thing that was very, very awesome about my dad is he had a card. I, I promise you that card was unlimited. I've never swiped that card that it said insufficient funds. I never knew how much there was in there, but I'm, I'm convinced he was linked to heaven somehow. Whenever I needed something, now my father, out of the good of his heart, he blessed us. He wanted to show an example of our heavenly father, and he really did that. If it wasn't more for my father, I don't think I would be standing here today. But I'm not referring to the good times. I'm referring now to the bad times, where I messed up where well, I've written off cause, where well, I've done things that was not good. And that God that under, had unlimited limits <laughs> was swiped even in my bad times. If we make debt today towards one another, if we go into quarrels with one another, this is exactly what he says, forgive us our debts. As we forgive those who is in debt to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Clothe yourself with Jesus Christ. Because you, man, you're not going to be able to do it. I'm sorry. In 2,000 years, not even the Dalai Lama is perfect. You might see a picture of him, but uh, no one knows what is in a man except the man himself. And you are a man and a woman, and you know that within you, there are thoughts, there are ideas, and Jesus says, don't even say to your brother, Raka, <laughs> you fool. If you say to someone, you fool, you are in the dangers of the fire of hell. Do we take that up seriously? No, not quite. Because we still walk around and say, you fool. <laughs> Abdul, you fool. <laughs> oh, Lord, help. Ah, thank you, Jesus. Let's go to Isaiah, yeah. I think, let's, let's pop into Isaiah. Who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. For he has no form, no comeliness. And when shall we see him? There is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men and men of sorrows and acquainted with grief and we hid as it were our faces from him and he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our grief, sickness, weakness and distresses and carried our sorrows and pains of punishment. Yet we ignorantly considered him stricken, smitten and afflicted by God as if we were with leprosy. But he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised 
for our guilt and iniquities. Come on, and Paul writes, he says, I want to know nothing amongst you except Christ and him crucified. Why? Because he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our guilt. What is guilt? Guilt means you stand in front of the judgment and say you are guilty. Even though you are guilty, you are standing before the judge today and says you are innocent. Why? Because he became our guilt. <laughs> and iniquities and the chastisement, the needful to obtain peace and well-being for us was upon him. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And with the stripes that wounded him, we are healed and made whole. My goodness. All judgment was put on Jesus Christ. Let's carry on reading. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has made to light upon him the guilty and the iniquity of us all. Sure. Do you see yourself in there? It says us all. He was oppressed, yet when he was afflicted, was submissive and opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and as a sheep before a shearer is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. My goodness. So for everything that you have ever done wrong and still gonna do wrong, That guilt was put on Jesus, the Son of God. And even knowing that your sin is upon him, he dared not open his mouth. Ah, oh, man. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away and was cut off of the land of the living, stricken to death for the transgressions of my people to whom the stroke was due. And they assigned him a grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief and made him sick. When you and he make his life an offering for sin. And he was risen from the dead. In time to come. Now I, we are reading Isaiah. Matthew is still a far away coming. <laughs> God had a plan. When he writes in Jeremiah, it says, I know you before you were even formed. And he shall see the fruit of my travail of his soul and be satisfied and by knowledge of himself which he possesses in parts to others. So shall my uncompromisingly righteous one, my servant, justify many and make many righteous, upright and in right standing with God. For he shall bear their iniquities and their guilt with consequences, with the consequences, say the Lord. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great kings and the rulers and he shall divide the spoil with the mighty because he poured out his life unto death and ye let himself be regarded as a criminal and be numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore and took away the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors, the rebellion. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Isaiah 54, verse 7. For a small moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. In a little wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness, I'll have mercy on you, Amen. said the Lord, your Redeemer. God gives his promise over you that he will never leave you, that he will never forsake you. That is his promise, and God is not a liar. Yeah. Amen. So if he says, for a moment, I have forsaken you, and for a moment, I have hidden my face from you, 
He's talking about his son. This is why I say there can be no love in judgment. When Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he could not feel the love of the Father anymore. Because God had to step in and judge and he knows that there is no love in judgment. Ah, Jesus. I don't know if you understand what I'm seeing. The ultimate love had to cease loving for a moment so that he can judge. And it's not just any person. It is his only son. It was his everything. For greater love. I, I hope this verse makes a lot more sense to you right now. For greater love has no man than a man laid down his life for his friend. It is God giving a promise to his son because he knows there's gonna come a time where he's gonna have to turn away his face from him and he's gonna have to judge him so that me and you today can stand without judgment. So he that is spiritual judges all things. If you don't understand that, man, you will cause havoc for the rest of your life on yourself. You are not called to judge. It's just beautiful if we read Isaiah 54. It says, and your children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall the peace be of your children. In righteousness you shall be established, and thou shalt be far from oppression. For you shall not fear, and from terror, for it shall come not near you. Behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me, whatsoever shall gather in Garazon. So now we get to the place where you can say, yes, that is mine. Isaiah 54 is for me, because if I'm clothed with Christ, then all that is Christ's is mine. God is speaking to me about revival, and we're gonna, we are seeing it, we are busy experiencing it. This Reconnect conference is about reconciliation. God is calling us for the ministry of reconciliation. God is sending fathers to the house to love and to teach and to open up. Hmm. 1 John 4. Beloved, Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world, whereby you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confess Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that confess not Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God, and this is the spirit of the Antichrist. Wherefore you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. You are of God, little children. I want to take you back to Isaiah 54. Your children shall be taught of the Lord, and they shall have peace. So you are of God, little children. That means he's speaking to us. And have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world hears them. But we are of God, and he that knows God hears us, and he that is not of God heareth not us. Whereby we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Okay, verse seven. Beloved, My father always used to tell this story. John the Beloved, he was the last one of the disciples that was left. After all of them were killed for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of Christ. John was thrown with oil and uh, he went through all the things, but he was the only one left. And uh, 
after praying so much in Patmos, his knees didn't work anymore and they had to carry him from church to church. And wherever they sat him down in the church, all he would say is, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And anyone who loves is known of God. He that loves not knows not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God towards us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we may live through him. Clothe yourself. We are so afraid to trust one another because of experiences, because of what other people has done to us. That we come into the church, we come into the house, we come into one another's conversations with so many masks, and we cannot be vulnerable because how we have been hurt. Now, I'm not saying come and confess all your things to me. Please don't do that. <laughs> confess your things to God if you still struggle then come <laughs> but our love has become so conditional because of what we have experienced before and I don't know sure God has been speaking a lot to me about this the last few months is the bitterness and the hurt that we keep in our hearts because of what has happened keeps us from understanding the mysteries of God. Because if I accept the unconditional love of God and then I get the opportunity to love and I love conditionally, it's not, it's not right. I think I've repented the last six months, probably more than I've repented in my whole life. And not because I'm sinful, because I want my heart pure. But the more that I'm experiencing God's love, the less I even worry about those things. At the end of the day, you can say that you are justified and what these people did not do to you is not right and this is what happening to me is not right and how can this be and this and this and then just stop for one second. Just stop for one second and think about everything in your life. If it was not for Jesus, what would have happened to you? What is due to you? Okay, Philippians 2. If there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, fulfill you my joy that we'll be like-minded, having the same love being of one accord and of one mind. Ah, verse 3 in Amplified. Do nothing from factional motives through covetousness, strife, selfishness, or for unworthy ends, or promoted by conceit and empty arrogance. Instead, in the true spirit of humility, lowliness of mind, let each regard the others as better and superior to himself, thinking more highly of one another than you do of your self. Let each of you esteem and look upon and be consecrated for not merely his own interest, but also for the each interest of others. Okay, then he says, let this attitude and purpose, the humble mind, be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, and let him be your example in humility. 
Going back to 1 Corinthians 2. <laughs> Who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And now we can be clothed with him. Thank you, Father. 